Thank you very much. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here with you uh, at this incredible conference, at this inflection moment in our history, when we are actually recognizing that the burnout and stress epidemic has become truly global and that we cannot continue to accept it as the norm. It happened to me personally when uh, two years into building the Huffington Post, I crashed, I collapsed, I hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone, and that was the beginning of my recognizing that I and millions of others around the world had bought into the delusion that in order to succeed, we have to be always on, we have to burn out, we have to basically sacrifice our humanity in this delusion that that's the only way to succeed. We now know that these workplaces are not working. They are not working anywhere in the world. And they are not working here. They are not working in the region. They are not working within UAE when we have 64% of businesses complaining about stress being a major factor affecting business outcomes. This became my passion, so much so that a year and a half ago, I left the Huffington Post to launch a new company, Thrive Global, and put this issue, this mission at the center, reducing the stress and burnout epidemic around the world, working with corporations to help them realize that this is not a fluffy HR issue. This is directly connected with business metrics. It affects productivity. We have a new Gallup poll that shows that 87% of employees around the world are disengaged at work. Who wants disengaged employees who are always on? They may be at work, but maybe they are updating their Facebook status or texting their friends, not really completely 100% present with what they are doing. And we are also seeing the impact on attrition. Burnt out employees are 30% more likely to leave their jobs. We are seeing the impact on healthcare costs. We are seeing an epidemic of diabetes, heart um, disease, all of them directly connected with stress. In fact, a stunning statistic is that 75% of healthcare costs and healthcare problems are directly related to stress and preventable, 75%. So clearly, the way we're working is not working. It's not working for women, it's not working for men, it's not working for business outcomes. The second crisis that is exacerbating the first is the fact that we are becoming increasingly addicted to our devices. That we are always on, and as a result, we have become much more unable to do focused, deep work to connect with ourselves and our loved ones, and the impact on mental health is becoming worse and worse every day. Here in the region, Two out of the three healthcare problems are related to depression and anxiety. This is an amazing moment when you have both a minister of happiness and a minister of artificial intelligence. I love that, and it really is an amazing omen about the future. And once again, we have women who are participating at greater and greater numbers recognizing that in order to be able to fully participate and not abandon their jobs at some point, we need to be able to change the way workplaces are figured out and also change this expectation that we have to be always on. Because when was the last time you had a good creative idea while texting or being on WhatsApp? We have many of our best ideas while being in the shower, while being on the golf course, while we are allowing ourselves to connect with our own wisdom and creativity. 
And everything I'm saying and all the solutions are based on a fundamental philosophical truth that is absolutely common to all religions and spiritual philosophies. And this is that every human being has at our center a place of wisdom, strength, and peace. And when we are disconnected from that, that's when the worst problems and crises in the world occur. But right now, let's face it, we take much better care of our smartphones than we take care of ourselves. We know at every moment how much battery remains in our smartphone. But do you know how much battery you have left? Do you know when you are running on empty? Do you know when you need to recharge? Because from that place of recharging, we are going to be infinitely more effective. 70% of the world sleeps with their phones by their bed. And that in itself shows how we have forgotten how to truly recharge. There was a great study recently done by Harvard and the University of Virginia in which they asked participants whether they would prefer to be alone in a room for 15 minutes without any devices, or whether they would prefer to get electric shock. And 67% of men chose electric shock. Among the wiser sex women, 25% chose electric shock. But we've gotten to the point where we cannot be alone with ourselves for 15 minutes. As Thich Nhat Hanh said, it has never been easier to run away from ourselves. And in the attention economy, social media companies are, of course, monetizing our attention. So they have very powerful algorithms and machine learning that knows how to hook and hijack our attention at every moment. So you see distracted parents not being able to connect with their children. You see distracted employees not being able to connect with what is really in front of them to achieve. And that's why at Thrive Global, we created an app. I know it's paradoxical, but we need to have technology help us disconnect from technology. So our app helps you put your phone in Thrive mode. So if you're having a meal with your family and you don't want to be distracted, or if you're creating the next amazing innovation that will change the world and you don't want to be distracted, you can put your phone in Thrive Mode. And if I'm in Thrive Mode and you text me or WhatsApp me, you're going to get a message back that says, Ariana is in Thrive Mode until such and such a time. So it's bi-directional because that way will help change the culture. We need to move away from glamorizing being always on, from glamorizing and praising people for returning texts and emails and WhatsApp messages immediately, to glamorizing people who know how to prioritize, who know what's important, who know when they have to disconnect from their phones and what's oncoming in order to be able to connect with themselves and their best ideas and connect with their loved ones. And also, the app allows you to have a mirror of all your social media consumption. Wouldn't you like to see every day how much time you've spent on Instagram, how much time you've spent on Candy Crush, or whatever game you may be addicted to? And if, let's say, I spent an hour and a half on Instagram, I promise you I didn't, the app will ask me, do you want to reduce it? And if I say, yes, I want to reduce it to one hour, it will send me notifications, and at one hour, it will cut me out. I know it's tough love, but we all need a coach, a guide, to help us navigate this new technology, which is very new. The smartphone is only about 10 years old. So at the moment, 
um, our Thrive app has been launched in partnership with Samsung. It's available on all Android phones, and in the next five months, it will also be available on iOS. But anybody on Android, you can start using it now. It's free, and it, the idea is to begin to shift the culture away from this obsession of being always on. And we see it with our children. Here at, the U, at UAE, we have children who are spending more than five hours a day on social media. And we have the data now from child psychologists that show that any child that does that is much more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety. Why? Because the world presented by social media is the highlight reel of anybody's, everybody else's life. And children and teenagers, before they have their own foundation to stand on, are constantly living in a state of comparison, comparing their lives with their insecurities, with their sense of fear about the future, which has all human responses, comparing that to the perfectly filtered reality of their friends' lives. And after all, what is a like? that people obsess over, how many likes their Instagram picture got. It takes less than a second to like something. But it, it moves us into this self-validation feedback loop. It gives us a little dopamine hit that keeps us hooked. So the minute you give your child a phone, you need to teach your child phone hygiene. And a lot of women who are still the primary caretakers of children are realizing that we have to change that relationship. And we have to prioritize again, disconnecting in order to reconnect with ourselves and our loved ones. And women are paying a particularly heavy price because women in stressful jobs have a 40% greater threat of heart disease and a 60% greater risk of um, diabetes. And that's why we have so many women who really are choosing to opt out instead of throwing themselves into those workplaces which still remain fueled by machismo burnout. And over the last year, we saw that Workplaces that are fueled by burnout also lead to men acting out and also lead to terrible business outcomes. So we have an opportunity now to redesign the world of the future. Uh, we have an opportunity to recognize that when actually we prioritize our own well-being, we are also prioritizing business outcomes. And you know where we see that so clearly with athletes? More and more athletes are now showing their better stats after they've had a good night's sleep, after they've taken time to recharge. So recovery is part of performance. Connecting well-being and performance is now proven by all modern scientists and demonstrated by many athletes and by many corporate athletes. On the Thrive Global Media Platform, we bring together the latest data, the latest science connecting well-being with performance, and also new role models. We had, for example, Jeff Bezos write a piece, and the headline will amaze you, the headline was, why am I getting eight hours of sleep is good for Amazon shareholders. And he annotated his decision making. And he actually said that he notices that when he gets six hours sleep, his decisions are five to 20% less good. And after all, the future of all your businesses are based on your decisions. The same with entrepreneurs who have this myth of the entrepreneur who is always on, who never sleeps. But let's look at the data. Three quarters of startups fail. 
might we have different outcomes if entrepreneurs were actually prioritizing their own well-being? As they tell us on aeroplanes, put your own oxygen mask first. And then you can help others and you can help your business in a much more effective way. So the reason why this is an amazing time to be alive is because for the first time, modern science is validating ancient wisdom. Sleep, for example, I wrote an entire book on sleep, The Sleep Revolution, is a very new science. The first scientific sleep center was founded at Stanford in 1970. And we have recognized through the new science that sleep is not optional. And that in fact, sleep deprivation affects every disease, both physical and mental, because our brain has two modes, either alert and achieving things, or sleeping and cleaning up. And if we don't give our brain the time to clean up the toxins that have accumulated during the day, we actually live in a state of perfect, perpetual chaos. So it's really exciting to have so much new science validating so much of what our ancestors knew but we have forgotten. And that's why I think this combination of prioritizing happiness while also innovating and tapping into our creativity is such a magical combination of two aspects of humanity. And I like what Sheikh Mohammed said in his speech about the human being always being at the center of innovation. We sometimes forget that, but it is the absolute truth, and that's why feeding ourselves, nurturing ourselves is so essential. You know, we all think that we are more productive when we multitask. But you know that multitasking is actually a complete delusion. It doesn't exist. We are task switching. We are not multitasking. And it's one of the most stressful things we can do. So at Thrive Global in, and in our work with corporations, we recommend, for example, having meetings that are device-free. Because, you know, people come to meetings with their laptops and their phones and they claim they are taking notes. Most of them are not taking notes. They are updating their Facebook status or they are answering emails and texts and they are not fully present. Just try having meetings without devices and you'll be amazed by how present people are you'll be amazed by how much more creative they are. And that is really at the heart of everything we're doing is the need for greater creativity and less stress. We are celebrating all the new technologies that have changed the world, but 2017 was the year when we also recognized the unintended consequences of these technologies. And we have recognized especially the impact on our children and the impact on our ability to innovate. Because we all know that machines are going to take more and more of the functions that we've been engaged in right now, but machines can never take over creativity, can never take over the great new ideas that will shape the future. So creativity will become more and more at a premium in every organization. So right now, we are at this moment when we have a choice. Uh, we have a choice to continue to allow technology to be controlling us, or we have the choice to recognize that technology is a phenomenal tool and a terrible master. And I think women have an amazing opportunity to redesign the way workplaces and the work are designed. Because let's face it, the world of work has been designed by men. 
And I'm sorry, gentlemen, but it is not working. So we need women to lead the way to redesigning it. And I promise you one thing, men are going to be incredibly grateful to us because they are also paying a very heavy price. I'm so incredibly thrilled that you've put happiness at the center of what you're doing. Because what is the point of creating the brave new world of the future if human beings are so stressed out, frenetic, and unable to enjoy the world we're creating? That's why these two come hand in hand. That's why our own happiness, which is really so connected to our ability to connect to the deepest part of ourselves, is at the center of the new world we need to create. Right now, let's face it, we are drowning in data and starved for wisdom. Just look around the world. The problem is not that we have leaders without high IQs. The problem is that we have leaders who are sleep deprived, exhausted, running on empty, and lacking wisdom. And that's why we need to look again at what we have created by this delusion that you have to be always on and to burn out in order to succeed. It's actually a fundamental issue of redefining what success is. I'm Greek, as you can gather from this accent, and Greek philosophers have always obsessed with defining what is a good life. And a good life has now been shrunken down to the definition of a successful life, which has been shrunken down to the definition of money and power. But money and power by themselves are a two-legged stool. Sooner or later, you fall off. The third leg of the stool is happiness. And happiness consists of our well-being, our capacity to tap into our own wisdom, to wonder at the mystery of life and to give back. Without all these elements, life is incredibly impoverished. And there is so much wisdom here in your own culture that we can tap into in order to redesign the world of the future. What is really exciting is to recognize that when we tap into our own wisdom, we have the solutions for the future. And we see that again and again. We see it among men, we see it among women, and we see it also among those women who are no longer asking simply to join men at the top of every profession in every country. That is no longer enough. Women need to ask to redesign the world that, we, that they want to inhabit at the top. <clears throat> it's no longer enough to simply ask for all the privileges of leadership. We need to lead the world into a different future. So this is an amazing moment to have this conference. Because while we are celebrating the incredible world of technology that we have created, we are also looking at the dangers that we have inherited. And, and um, I'm delighted to see the president of the World Bank walk in, because he's a very wise man who understands all that, who has actually recognized that when we bring in these tools to our employees, the tools of learning how to disconnect and reconnect with our own wisdom, we create much more effective and much more successful workplaces. So let me sum up by saying that we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence. And we've heard a lot about how artificial intelligence in the future will become more intelligent than human beings. But let me just say something unequivocally. Artificial intelligence may become more intelligent than we are, 
but artificial intelligence will never, ever be more creative, more compassionate, more caring, more loving, or wiser than we are. And the future will be determined by the abundance of these qualities. So while the world is obsessing with augmented reality, I would love to invite women leaders to obsess over augmented humanity because that's the way to win the future. The way to win the future is to tap into this augmented humanity from which we can find all the solutions to all the major problems we are facing. Because wherever we look, we see the same debate going on about the problems we are facing, whether it's climate change or growing income inequalities, the conversation has been going on and on about the need for solutions. But the solutions have not been forthcoming. And the reason for that is, is not the absence of data, it's the absence of wisdom. And when we recognize that wisdom is not going to be found in artificial intelligence, wisdom is going to be found in the center of every human being's heart. But when we are disconnected from that center, when we instead live our life on the periphery, on the surface, always frenetic and always burnt out, we are missing out the greatest gift that we have been born with. And this is an amazingly, amazingly exciting moment to be alive because we are finally recognizing it. And more and more leaders are speaking out about it. So when we recognize that we carry in us the source of a lot of solutions, if only we gave ourselves a little occasional break to reconnect with that part, then there will be more and more incentive to do so. But we need leaders to model it. And we need leaders to talk about it. And we need leaders who stop acting as though what they need to brag about is being always on, is foregoing sleep and time to disconnect and reconnect with themselves. As my great Greek compatriot Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and I can move the world. So we all need to find that place to stand. And from that place, we can build lives that have all the greatest technological advances that we are achieving and that are changing our world, but also have all the wisdom and caring and loving that are needed in order to create a world that we do want to inhabit. This year in Davos, Jack Ma actually said that while the last decade the competitive advantage was muscle. This new decade, the competitive advantage, he said, is going to be wisdom. And then he talked about moving beyond IQ and beyond EQ, emotional intelligence, to what he called LQ, which is the love quotient. So it's kind of amazing to have one of the major tech leaders of our time identify that these intangible qualities, which have traditionally been more identified with women, these intangible qualities of loving and caring and compassion are actually going to be determining for the future. If we want to win the future, we need to put them at the center of the future we are creating. And that means building technology infused with humanity. And that means women who have traditionally been identified with these virtues leading the way into a future which actually is going to encompass the best of artificial intelligence and the best of augmented humanity. Thank you so much. <laughs>